For trichomes.com, I'm Jesse Batend, and this is The High Ground. On this show, we talk to leaders of the cannabis community, CEOs, farmers, public officials, anyone who's making an impact on the cannabis community and beyond. For a long time, if you were someone who was interested in growing cannabis, one of the main challenges was getting good peer-vetted information. Nowadays, the future 4200 forums are the go-to place for information on cannabis cultivation and extraction. And today, we're talking with the man behind the future 4200 handle. Dustin Powers, as he's perhaps less commonly known, is the founder of Good Life Gang, a membership club that hosts networking events and supports cannabis businesses. He is also the co-founder of the Future 4200 Forum, which I previously mentioned, and the founder of Consulting Futures. But for a guy who is such a center of community, the interesting thing about Dustin's story is it actually starts with him just trying to get away from it all. Dustin, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. So first things first, do you mind kind of giving us a, a sense of you you have a, a very interesting land set up out there. Do you mind giving us a sense of kind of how you're you're getting through this pandemic or where you're where you're sheltering? Yeah, sure. So uh, my my uh, domestic partner and I and our our son, we live out here in South Bend, Washington. That's on the southwest coast of Washington, about an hour north of Oregon. Um, we have we own 40 acres up in the hills here. We lease another 50 acres down in the flats and then we own another 10 acres where we're currently building a house. Um, and then we also rent a little house down in town. Um, and that sounds extravagant, but it's actually dirt cheap out here. It's, that's why we mm-hmm. ended up out here. Um, and, and originally, I bought all this land as part of my bug out plan because I just got I got lost in the sauce on the conspiracy theories, and that you know the government's trying to fuck us. So I uh, I realized my only path towards sanity was to buy some land to bug out, and that kind of came full circle because I got into permaculture. You know, and I was in permaculture when I was looking for the land, but I really got you know deep into the permaculture once I acquired the land and started planting my own food, growing my own food. And it brought me full circle back around to realizing that it's community that we need. So I I kind of ditched the bug out um, mindset and have moved much more into this, you know, the better the people around me do, the better my life gets. So that's kind of like the core of the the level up principle that we're, that I'm talking about all the time. Um, so we're out here bugging out on the coast, and it's really just business as usual for us out here. It's springtime, so we're doing all the all the springtime agricultural chores and getting ready for the the summer. Um, so it's it's been it's been pretty normal for us as far as that goes. The biggest difference is that I've been spending a lot more time here than I normally do, since I'm not doing you know regular gang meetups or anywhere near as many consults or anything right now. Sure, and. You actually brought up something that I, I kind of want to dig into a little bit, which is that concept of a permaculture. For people who are listening who aren't necessarily familiar, how do you define the concept and, and kind of apply it in your life? Yeah, sure. And <clears throat> you hear a lot of things about permaculture and agriculture, but really it's a design science based on identifying successful natural patterns and, and applying those to your own life in all of its various forms. So I've, I've put on some classes and lectures on various ways to apply permaculture. Uh, I did like a permaculture for the hash maker or, or like the hash business. Um, and, and that has gone really well. And, it, and it's, like I said, it's just about I, identifying these patterns that nature has spent millions of years refining, you know, based on just calling out the week. And then can I, reapply that back out. And, and the easiest example is, okay, a, a wild forest is a very successful thing on its mm-hmm. own. There's very little human intervention. How and why is that happening? And can I replace those species of plants and animals in that system with plants and animals that I want to eat and have just as hands off a successful system? And the answer is yes, like overwhelmingly yes. And in fact, with a, with a little bit of appropriate human management, you can take that system and make it significantly more productive. And, and we can see that in the cows. You know, the, the way that I raise my cattle is uh, it's on this holistic mob grazing, basically, or holistic management. And the idea being that I am a grass farmer. I, I'm very specifically managing the growth of my grass. The cattle are the tool that are doing that. Um, but that whole system evolved over millions of years. Uh, like we look at the plains of North America and the, the bison, wolf, 
uh, relationship out there is why the plains, when the white people came, they, they reported 30 feet deep topsoil. And that's because those those bison had spent millions of years in, in perfect harmony with the pastures, with the wolves, uh, with the ecosystem, and brought great abundance. Now, we don't have any wolves anymore, and, and my, my bison are, are cattle, but so if I take the role of that wolf as far as the management goes and keep those cattle moving constantly so that the grass has a chance to regrow, I can have a much more productive system than, than the standard approach of just letting cows out into a field and let them do their own thing. Um, and so it, uh, that's another example of identifying a successful pattern and applying it. And again, that's an easy one because cows look a lot like bison and they, they do very similar things. Where did the interest in a permaculture come from initially? And, and did that kind of tie into, you know, as you mentioned, your sort of like bug out phase? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I was I was at a point in my life where I was driving, you know, four or five days a week. I had a big route from Southern Oregon out to Salt Lake City and we were delivering produce all over the country and um, music was putting me to sleep. So I found podcasts pretty early on. And one of the first ones I found was Jack Spierko's The Survival Podcast. And he's all about preparedness for if times get tough or even if they don't. Um, and so he was the one that introduced me into permaculture. He was the guy that really got me on this mindset of personal liberty and, and uh, how just chasing conspiracy theories is a waste of time because you can't do anything about them. And really the only thing you can do about any problem is fix yourself. The only solution that I found, and, and Jack Spirico sent me down this direction, was um, make your own life better. And uh, initially, I, I you know I was on that bug out grind, and and Jack Spirico still was pushing you know buy land, grow as much food as you can on that land, uh, and so those things all kind of overlapped nicely with my my bug out plans, which were based on the overwhelming suspicion that all per, all uh, conspiracy theories are probably real or have some sort of realness. And that's <laughs> terrifying because that, you know, it's, it's the, the government is definitely out there to fuck us. So this whole bug out thing transitioned into this permaculture thing where now it's my, my preparedness is like a whole healthy life. And it, you know, and it starts with growing my own food and, and that, you know, so we own the, most of these properties outright and they produce a massive abundance of food with very little input uh, from us at this point. Now, that's not to say we didn't put a, a bunch of time and effort into getting to these where they are. But now that they're in this system of, of stability and, and, and replication as well, like forest boundaries expand these these fruit or these, these food forests that we're implementing like to spread and, and then they attract the wildlife, which then spreads it even further. Um, now that we're there, I've gotten to this point in my life where I don't feel the need to, to work as hard as I ever did a, a, to work for money. Let me say, you know, when I'm mm. out doing something, I want to put a hundred percent into it, but, but I, I've got this freedom now where I spend a lot more of my time sitting on my permaculture farm, just watching things that, you know, there's a saying in permaculture, you're supposed to do a hundred hours of thinking for every hour of work, you know, and huh. I, as a young man, I laughed at that. I said, that's stupid. And then went and, you know, planted trees where I shouldn't have, or I went and did a bunch <laughs> of work, you know, as I look back on it now, I'm like, well, yeah, no, they're right. That's why all those old boys, you know, all these 60, 70 year old permaculture gurus are, are saying this over and over. Well, they were right. I, I can see that now. Um, and, and I'm not stressed about that time. You know, when I was younger, I was stressed about that time. I felt like it was wasted time. I should be doing something productive. But And a lot of that was from this scarcity mindset of I need to be productive to make more money to survive, you know, the, mm. the, for the, in the future. And, and I've, I've through all of this preparedness by, by establishing long-term savings, diversified savings of all sorts of different assets, uh, by having a year's worth of food stored and an endless amount of food on the horizon. Like my cows, cows are a beautiful thing. They multiply for free. <laughs> they fuck and then there's more of them. It, it's the craziest <laughs> thing. As long as it rains, the grass grows and then you have more cows. It's like I, I couldn't not have enough food if I if I tried. And that that is like the ultimate freedom right there. And it, because then you start looking at this from a, uh, you step back and you look at this as a society. Well, if you, most people spend a good portion of their income, like 10, 15% on their food. Um, if you can eliminate that, that's 10 to 15% in, 
uh, income that you didn't need. And that means significantly less tax, you know, that, that proportional amount difference in taxes. And, and this, this kind of goes deeper than just food. You know, permaculture is really easy to identify via agriculture for food. But when you start looking at all of the byproducts that my farm produces besides just food, you know, super high quality, uh, wood products and, and all sorts of crazy plant medicinal products and, and the educational aspect that this whole thing come becomes we get, we bought super cheap land and have turned it into a food and revenue producing machine. It's crazy. Um, the, the appetite for people to learn this bef- even before this pandemic was, was growing at fever pace. And now in the middle of this pandemic, everybody's talking about a victory garden. Everybody realized that, you should have some food and oh it's it's nice not to rel- have to rely on the government first of all but also a job you know 6 months ago everybody on earth would have told you that having a job was the safe play it's like how many of the people now think the same thing right a job is only cool if, if times are good and if you didn't have any money or f- food stored and uh, you've got rent to pay like this is this is a scary time to be alive so in your case, you mentioned that you, you have cows. Is it true that you you got the cows initially because of food? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so I, I, you know, I've got a, an appetite for books. I, I've been building a library. So I, I scour every, all the permaculture books that I can get my hands on. And I came across this one uh, by a man named Greg Judy, and it's called No Risk Ranching. And it's actually the second one in a series of his. And the first one's called Comeback Farms. And the first one is tells the story of how he got to where he is. Um, and then the second one gives the, the hard details on exactly how you can do exactly what he's doing. He bought his family farm and about went bankrupt on it. And huh. where, he, where he saved himself was he started where he's at. People will pay you to take their cows in the spring and they weigh them when you take them. And then when you give them back in the fall and they weigh them again and you get paid based on the difference in weight that they gained. And so oh. it's called custom, uh, custom grazing. So he got other people's cows and then he went around to all of his neighbors and there's a, a bunch of old couples. And he said, look, I, if you pay me 50 bucks a month, I'll maintain all this pasture so that it looks really nice all around here. And they were stoked because it was just overgrown and they weren't doing anything with it. So he's getting paid $50 a month to raise other people's cows that he's going to get paid at the end of the year on the fattening fee. And he scaled that up to an insane level. He's got like 2000 acres under management now. And, and all of this is being done with just the most holistically planned management you could imagine. And this is like, he's like a a hick out in the Midwest. That's just way better at math than you. And it has this Uh, like uh, innate uh, connection to the earth. Like, don't talk to him about weed. Oh my God. That, like you're the, you're the antichrist. I stood up, I went to this class on his site and uh, there's like 80 people there and we had to go around and then introduce each other, ourselves. I stood up and told him about like my cannabis history and how I had now a couple cows on a few acres that I was leasing. And everybody looked at me like I was the devil, like I should not oh, have told wow. him all. It was crazy. So these are like old boys that have got it figured out through this deep innate permaculture system that is, and, and they look at it like, we're making more money. We have healthier cows, healthier grass. We need less water. We're sequestering carbon. So now we're selling carbon offsets and we have a higher quality beef that these yuppies are willing to pay a premium for. All we have to do is take care of the the earth while we do it. Great. This is easy. So I, uh, I read those books and was like, okay, if this guy, he makes it sound so simple. So we leased about three, well, four acres of pasture and bought three cows and then on the, the four acres was just fenced around in the perimeter. Actually, it's only fenced on like two sides. We had to do perimeter fencing on the other two sides. And then we came in and cross paddock the entire thing. So we turned this one big four acre field basically into, I think we had maybe a hundred cross paddocks. And we just did that with really lightweight poly wire fencing. So the whole thing's super cheap to set up. And then those cows in that system, we moved every six hours, got a new pasture and got shut off from the one behind, got all this automated gate system. And we ran it small scale like that for about a year and a half. We realized three cows was too many. So we butchered one and then we added a bunch of goats and chickens to the system. uh, And that worked pretty well for a a long time. Uh, But I ended up eating all those goats too. But I went, (laughs) I went and took the class about two years in. So I'd read the book, did all this for about two years, then went and took his class to really lock down the details on it and came back and we've leased 
the 50 acres that we're on now and we've gotten the herd size up to 11. I currently have eight, um, but I think one of them's pregnant. So I'll, I'll probably have nine here soon. So, oh, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. We, we've had a <laughs> lot of calves this year. It's crazy. We, and I had never, we, up until now, we'd never had a calf born of our own. We had just been kind of buying local cattle to get the, the herd right. We had bought a bunch of cow-calf pairs. but So now we've had four that were born on site, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is that is really cool. You mentioned that you felt like, at least maybe in the beginning, there was a sense that that I don't know, the interest in permaculture was in some way isolating you or, or I'm getting the sense that you, you kind of felt like it was like taking you away from people. And maybe that was the bug out phase kind of influencing your thinking. But how does all of this kind of lead you into what you're doing now with the forum and Good Life Gang, which is so much based yeah. around community and bringing people together? Yeah, absolutely. So just to clarify, my business partner and I had been you know, running our route, doing our gray market thing for about five years at that, at when I got to this tipping point where I told him, Hey, we got, I, I need a place in the woods or I'm going to lose my mind. Like hmm. this isn't working for me. I'm going to have to, I got to quit this job and go like recluse out in the forest for a couple of years. And he's like, well, okay, let's at least make it an investment. So you don't just disappear. And what were you doing at the time? Uh, we had like a nice gray market system. Bitcoin, USD, uh, medical, cannabis, arbitrage type thing going on. Um, that was very good to us. So this bug out was also a p- part of our planned retirement. So we had felt that we had gotten to this point in our cannabis careers. And this was pre-legalization. So we we're like, look, y- you know, you don't want to play with fire so long. We- we've done very well for ourselves and we haven't gotten in trouble. So let's keep it mm. that way. We'll buy this land. And, you know, these were pipe dreams at the time. Like, we'll buy the land, retire. That's, this is great. We did that. We retired for about six months and he was still in college at the time. I had, (laughs) I had, I had dropped out. Yeah. How old (laughs) were you? uh, So this was in 2012. So I was 22. Okay. Yeah. I'd been, I'd been out of college for about two years at that point. I dropped out. Um, And we had, we had run this kind of arbitrage thing for two years and it was really good to us. But so six months after we purchased the property and I was living out here, cannabis legalized in Washington and the first 15 licenses came to South Bend. This is this, like, I found this property out here in the middle of the woods, the the population of the two little towns, which the nearest towns after that are like 40 miles away. These two little towns had a joint population of maybe 2000 cannabis legalized. All the licenses come here instantly there's like 250 new jobs in this region. So the population here is just has, has doubled since we bought the, the property initially. Uh, the property values have gone through the roof. Everything's gotten crazy because of cannabis. And I said to my partner, I was like, dude, there's all this money here. This, there's a bunch of like Microsoft guys. There's all the, you know, it's the beginning of a new market. So it's just a bunch of dummies with money that are going to make a million dollars growing weed. I was like, oh, we got to get in on this. So we ended up setting up a, a legal Washington uh producer price processor at the time. They're just a processor now, but green labs, they're still going. I was the general manager and he was the sales director and he actually still is the sales director of that company. I quit. But, um, what happened is I was the general manager of that facility and the, the guy that owned it said, Hey, we're going to set up a lab. And I didn't know a whole lot about the lab at that point. And this is in like 2013, I guess. Um, and so the first thing we did, I, I, I had been open blasting. We were running a medical company that ran open blasted uh, hash oil for the in, in, the input materials. And I was already a, a decent fan of Skunk Farm, but I hadn't gotten too deep into it. Uh, and when he told me to set up the lab, we hired Skunk Farm to come do the consult. And Joe Oaks came and did it. And when he was leaving, he said, hey, you're a smart guy. You should come check out this operation I got down in Portland because this this place sucks. You don't want to be here. And so I went down and checked out Skunk Farmers. I just started this new venture called Farm Gold. And immediately I was working under uh, Sidco Cat and uh, Joe Oaks and Grey Wolf. And Grey Wolf is like the most OG extractor like open source and then the whole skunk farm thing is like was total open source give out all the information for free when you can and then you know people will flock to you and so we paid joe a lot of money for that day and i right there i was like wait a minute 
how is it that these guys give away everything for free, but my boss is willing to pay him whatever. Cause I said that these are the guys and that it really clicked for me right there is you, if you become the the person that everybody respects in the industry, you can charge whatever the fuck you, you think your time's worth and people will pay it. Especially mm-hmm. if you give away 90% or if you give away everything for free. So that, that really, uh, you know, I got into this open source uh, mindset as in, including like the forum and the forum being free and all of this for personal gain. Really. I realized that by leveling up the people around me, you know, how, whatever that, that the distance that circle is, even if it's strangers on the internet that use my forum by making their lives better, they're much more likely to make my life better uh, down the road. And so I I said, well, how can we just scale this up to as big as possible, especially as my Instagram following started to grow? I said, well, let's just make this forum completely free so that everybody can use it to make their own lives better. And then I bet more of them will hire me as a consultant down the road. And that it's worked out oh, every single time. So we, we gave away all the, you know, the, the pesticide remediation tech, gave that out completely for free, put it into a full SOP at, at, right at the beginning. Like that was when nobody was doing pesticide remediation. Uh, I got a lot of backlash from that one. Like, how dare you give that away for free? You're giving up all the, you're, you're giving away the game. <laughs> okay. Really? Really? Well, who was giving you the backlash? Um, other, you know, chemists or people, you know, there was other people in the industry that were, that are always close to these breakthroughs. So with the pesticide remediation specifically, that happened because California had a thriving distillate market, you know, crude and distillate market that had no regulations on testing. And then all of a sudden the state said, oh, by the way, you got a pesticide test, all of this, and it's got to pass pesticides. And California is a disgusting place. It's full of pests. All the soil, all the water, everything's contaminated there. It took forever for people to get good, clean plant material out of their California production just because the the level of the contamination was insane. And when they're testing parts per billion of microbutanol, that, that's insane. Um, so there was other people at the time working on this because this was a, hundreds of millions of dollars was sitting in, in distillate inventory that couldn't be sold overnight. And so... Uh, there was a lot of incentive for people to figure that one out. And I, the lab that I work with, was had, they had like a million dollars worth of distillate just sitting there. And they said, come down, we'll pay for the entire p- testing procedure, all the testing, all the, the analytical, everything. If you can figure out pesticide remediation. And I said, sure, but the deal is going to be, you can keep the IP and I can keep the IP. And either of us can do a, a, whatever we want with that IP, no restrictions at all. And they were like, yeah, sure, whatever. So, we figured it out. They remediated all their distillate and sold it when we were in a giant distillate drought. They had clean distillate. And I just gave away the, the SOP for free. And that was one of the cornerstones of how we started the forum. I think it's um, I think it's fair to say that that is a big part of uh, what I feel is, is almost um, a borderline like legendary status. I've heard people talk about you as, as this person who... I mean, there's just clearly a lot of respect um, among your peers within the industry. Who was who did that forum kind of attract? Uh, you know, middle of the night lab rats for sure. That was <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> Highly technical, um, but it, and it, it's grown. And it didn't have to go very far to get to the spot, but it's become the you know the number one place for cannabis processing communication on earth. There's not really a whole lot of other places even trying to to be that, but we just stumbled into this sweet spot where there's, there's nothing else that even, that even comes close to it. And so I I like to defer a lot of that, you know, I just, I've I've set up places that have allowed other people to thrive. And a lot of that, you know, praise comes back to me, but it shouldn't. It's a, it's a community. It's like I just built this spot where the community could exist, and the community is thriving. So, I, I don't know. It, 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 I, I tr- like I'm a capitalist at heart, right? I do all these things because it makes my life better. I I, I can profit off of them. I just believe that if other people profit more, it, um, then I can still get more than what I want out of it. But they're they're going to be a lot more enticed to do to do it because they're getting the lion's share of it. And I, I, try, I run a lot of my businesses, like the forum itself. I gave that 90% to Zach. I said, do whatever you want with this. Luckily, he didn't want to, you know, add a bunch of advertisements or he was, he's not doing it to get rich either. So it worked out well. Um, 
but that I run all of these, the businesses that I set up that way, you're going to do, if, if you've got some kind of idea and I'm going to invest in you, you take 90% of it, I'll take 10%. Uh, and then that keeps you completely driven. That's we've run businesses like that on the farm too. Like I, I'm still trying to get somebody to come out and grow mushrooms commercially on my property. I have all the logs, I have all the space. I'll even invest in your business so that you can do it here. I just want a cut of the mushrooms. Hmm. So in in the capitalist tradition, uh, you know, you you've named your organization uh, a gang, the Good Life Gang. Um, <laughs> the banks love that, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Uh, tell me, like, why why the name and and what do you do with the organization? Yeah, so it's it's a membership discount club, and I call it the Good Life Gang because first of all, a lot of us do come from the black market, um, and so it's kind of a a, a, a throwback to that. But also, there's a bunch of uh, chads in the industry, and they want to feel like they're being kind of, you know, badass. I'm in the cannabis now. I can tell all my <laughs> – and so they can say, oh, I'm also in a cannabis gang. Hell, yeah, it's chad day, dude. Uh, so it's excellent marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah 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 because so there's a there's a separation and i guess i i haven't made this clear enough because a lot of people are confused a lot of people are like oh the gang's really going downhill i'm like what do you mean they're like well i get onto the website and people are talking shit all the time i'm like wait wait wait, wait. you're talking about the forum so the future 4200.com is a forum that we have it's free it's open source that is a completely separate entity than the Good Life Gang. The Good Life Gang is a corporation. We uh, and it's a membership discount club. You can pay me. You join. I can save you thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on your lab that you're going to set up um, and, and continue to run uh, in exchange for you know, uh, like uh, uh, the value proposition is. I, I, I try not to let anybody buy the, the membership unless I think they're going to save more money immediately than the membership costs. Um, and then we also do events all over the world where we do regional meetups where everybody can come get together, talk to other people that are doing the same thing around them. Going, going from that, you mentioned that you guys do these events and these meetups. Um, we're looking at a very potentially different world for the, for at least the foreseeable (laughs) future than, than we did before. How does, um, what we're going through right now affect, some of your thinking about about the work that you're doing and and maybe about what you might do going forward yeah so first of all it sucked we had a, we we canceled quite a few events we had a big like 420 cannabis cup that was all hmm. planned out and paid for and uh a lot of my like my meetup in Spain got canceled right before span of it or it was right after span of this or it was supposed to be, but they closed all the venues and everything. So that that's all sucked. Um, the gang has been a nice like additional supplement to my income. So it, it didn't matter. You know, we're, we're down probably like 50 percent on our normal sales volume of new memberships and our renewal, which was supposed to be we had a big renewal on 420. And that was shit that I didn't get half the renewals I expected to. So, um, hmm. yeah, business is, business is bad. I'm glad I, my life doesn't rely on, on business, right? Like I don't, I don't have to make money. So that's, that's this whole, why this whole thing hasn't really been affecting me because I don't have to make money. But with that being said, we, uh, we had already been planning to host our, we're going to start doing knowledge stacking seminars, which is all about how did my partner and I get to this point where we live our life this way, where I, where, you know, how, how is it possible? I'm telling people that you don't actually need that much money. Like, or like, how do you get to this place where you don't need money? So we've got this, this course, this weekend, all inclusive, come eat and smoke with us and learn on, on site. We'll give you tours of all the different properties that we own, how they're making money, how they're sustainable, uh, yada, yada, this whole entire all inclusive thing. Um, that obviously can't happen right now. So we've got that kind of pushback. And then also we thank God I didn't start taking people's monies on, on this one, but we had a couple million dollars of interest into this business idea of agro tourism um, mm. with a Bitcoin, well, with a, a cryptocurrency backing. So it was called, it's, it, it is called permacoin. And the idea is that 
you should be able to take the table back to the farm. And then I want a vacation at that place too. I want to go, when I go somewhere tropical, I wish I could stay right on the farm where all of the food is grown and the, the beach is right there. Um, mm. So we're going to start this in Puerto Rico as our first one. And it's got this crowdsource investment model that uses the coin as a token on site, blah, blah, blah. But it's all reliant on people being able to, fr- being able not not only like being allowed to, but also being financially stable enough to be taking cool ass tropical vacations. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of all on hiatus. So, you know, this thing has affected all of our, all of our businesses at this point our most profitable ones, at least are based on community and people getting together and, and being, because that's like the essence of being human is eating good food in groups with other people, smoking some weed, like, that's great. Mm. That's what everybody wants to do. That's I've built my life around allowing me to do that as much as possible. So this whole thing sucks. I have a uh, antigen tests that are supposed to be here tomorrow. So I'm, I haven't decided I'm a very high certainty that my partner had it. Her mom was exposed directly to people that died in her little square dancing club in Kirkland in the initial outbreak here in the States. We oh were God. exposed to her she, she, they refused to test my mother-in-law because she, she had all the normal symptoms at the time, but she also had lost her sense of taste and smell completely. And they told her that's not a symptom of COVID. We're not allowed to test you. And this is like <laughs> two months before they're like, oh yeah, by the way, another symptom is you can't smell or taste. She got her husband sick. He had all the same symptoms. And then we were exposed to him right before we went to Europe. While we were in Europe, my partner had lost her sense of taste and smell right when we went to Paris, too. She was so pissed. I was like, man, these pastries are so good. Oh, no. Screw you. (laughs) She she was like, she was sick. My my kid was fine. You know, I had my year old kid with us and I didn't get any of it. But I'm almost positive that we all were. I know we were all exposed to it and I don't see why I wouldn't have caught it. I think I just got it when it was asymptomatic. So I've got these antigen tests. They're only about 80% effective and that's about as good as you're going to get on an antigen test right now, but it's still, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. For people who are interested in exploring permaculture uh, for businesses that perhaps are reassessing the way that they do supply line and their partners and their footprint geographically. Um, Where do you start? Is it just bugging out on some podcasts? Yeah. uh, I really like Jack Spierko. He does the best job that I've found so far of applying permaculture outside of agriculture. You can find endless resources on how to use permaculture to grow a better garden or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's, it's more difficult to find the, the, the resources that lead you down the strict design science. I have a book called uh, a pattern language and it's pretty interesting. And it's like a, it's a top down look to see how many of these permaculture principles can we apply to various aspects of human life? Like to the, to the down to like ergonomic chairs, they're, they're like applying permaculture. Like how, how can we overlap this? So that's a cool one. It's kind of abstract. Um, and then, but yeah, Jack Spierko, he's just, that, that guy is a, a whole nother level of, of like, <laughs> crazy and smart. Uh, I, I would start there. So, I guess last question for you, whether it's it's communities, businesses, cannabis in general, or or you know even beyond. Um, give us your pitch for why open source is is the way to go. I think the easiest pitch is that by open sourcing your own information, you become known as this. You know respectable community member. And that almost always leads you down the path to making more money because money comes from people and is just this representation of the relationship that I have with that person. And if that person likes me more because I'm the guy that's always giving out information, he's much more likely to, to buy something from me down the road or, or to support me or pay for whatever I'm doing. So I, I like to look at open source from like a purely personal gain, like capitalistic sense everything that I've open source has made me way more money than the stuff that I've tried to keep secret. So, I mean, I'm sure there's like much bigger overlapping like reasons and why it's good at a larger scale societal thing, but, but it's like, 
it's like the conspiracy theories, right? Like, what can I do here that makes my own life better? So how, like, how does open source fix my own life? It, it's made me the guy. It's made me the cannabis processing guy that everybody reaches out to, to, to get something solved. Dustin Powers is the founder of the Good Life Gang. He is the co-founder of the Future 4200 Forum, which is a separate organization and entity. He's also the founder of Consulting Futures, and he is the guy. Uh, (laughs) Dustin, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. You can find more cannabis industry reporting at trichomes.com, as well as more great shows like this one. If you're a member of the cannabis community and you have a story you want to share with us, reach out. You can reach the show at highground at trichomes.com. Please take a second to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. It really helps others find the show. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. The High Ground is produced by David Fortin. I'm Jesse Betend, and thank you for listening. <laughs>